everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk Weekly. I'm your host, Chris Chester. I'm joined tonight by Josh Gomez, Drew White, and Randy Bellew. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. Good, 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 good. All good. Right, cool. Well, we got a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into some hockey action. Game one of the Stanley Cup Finals was last night. The Kings won 3-2 to two in overtime over the New York Rangers. This is actually the first time that the cities of Los Angeles and New York have met in a major sporting event uh, championship since 1981. Uh, Josh, did you get a chance to catch it, check out the game? I, I was going to check out a, a little bit of it. I mean, it was a, honestly a lot more competitive than I expected. Mm-hmm. I mean, like me and Randy have talked about before, um, I thought whoever won the, the Western Conference Final was um, going to be more or less the favorite. And and I, I, I really got to give the Rangers credit. Um, and really the, um, because they – I mean, the game went into overtime, so obviously they weren't – I think – I think it might have been just um, they're kind of thrust into that um, into that Kings role, that King, the role the Kings were in a couple of years ago, where they weren't expected to be there. So whatever they do is going to be you know impressive, and I think that might be something that can maybe potentially propel them. I don't know if it would, but mm-hmm. it's something to think about. Randy, speak a little bit on the on why the the game was so close last night. Well, I think I think the Kings had a little bit of a hangover from the Blackhawks series. Uh, the Rangers were able to jump out to a quick two to nothing lead. Um, and by the end of the second period, the Kings had tied it up. I really thought the Rangers uh, really had an opportunity to slip away from them last night. I, I, I picked the Kings in six. Uh, had the Rangers been able to hold on to that game last night, I think we would have been looking at a very different series. Uh, I, I just think for the Rangers, they had the 2-0 lead in the first, <clears throat> and then you know they, they got outshot 20-3 to by the Kings in the third period. Uh, there's not been a team to get 20 shots in a period of a Stanley Cup final. 1996. I mean, that tells you the level of domination that the Kings came out. And then in overtime, especially frustrating for the for the Rangers, they get the game, they they are able to hold on and, and at least force overtime, and then they just lose it on a on a bad turnover. Uh, Lundqvist played good. He had 40 saves and gave up three goals with a 93% save percentage. Jonathan Quick just as well. Two gave up two goals with 25 saves. I think this is a big opportunity that was blown last night for the Rangers. Albeit it is only game one. I'm still sticking to my pick. I still think Kings in six. Uh, it, but we could have been looking at a very different series last night had the Rangers been able to hold on. You, you said that you thought that the uh, the Kings had a bit of a hangover. You think it's because they had to go to that seven game series with Chicago, went to overtime in the last game, then and you know like so all of that. The Rangers finishing their series quicker. You think that had an effect on the Kings going into this series? Not as much. The Kings have only played one more game than the Rangers in the playoffs so far. But I think the physicality of the series with the Blackhawks, that was a that was a very much a grinded out series. I, I think it did, especially early in the game. The Kings the Kings showed it. Uh they uh it was relatively even on shots in the first period. The Kings had a slight advantage fourteen to thirteen. And if you're the Rangers, you'll give that up. Uh but I it just seemed to be when that third period came around, um you, you, you kinda knew you kinda knew the run was coming. And uh, the, the Rangers, all they could do was get it to overtime. Then, unfortunately, they gave it up on a bad turnover that uh, was was pretty much a breakaway goal that ended the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can really argue too. Both like the, both of those, the, the Kings' last two overtime goals were both kind of fluky. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if you go back to that game seven, what they basically did was they just parked someone, they camped someone right there by Corey Crawford the entire game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I well, mean, one, one make a little. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, you can make a legitimate case that, I mean, they're kind of like what the Kings have always been in the last few years. They're, they're just kind of right place, right time. They're opportunistic. Yeah, that was the word I was looking for. It was once, once you get into overtime, any bounce can go any way and any team yeah. can win. If, if, if the Kings have been able – the funny thing is that the, going into the playoffs, the Rangers were the lowest scoring team, and, and they've just like – been shooting through the they just been shooting the lights out you know like it, I don't know I don't know where the Kings developed all this offense in the last couple of series but they did and being able to get um, three goals in the last the two periods in overtime to win the game that, that showed a lot of determination if the Rangers had stolen game one like Randy said this would have been a different series uh, Drew did you watch the game last night I have did not get to watch a game I honestly forgot that the conference finals was on because I was so busy with schoolwork so I can't really give you guys much. Right. Unfortunately, I am really sorry about that. How, how much of a how much of an advantage do you think it is to have a goalie who gets forty saves in a game? Like that's a that's a huge, that's a ridiculous number. If if he doesn't get even ten of those saves, I, I mean the game could have been a lot yeah. more of a blowout than it was. So 
I think. How much of an advantage of it? Well, that means you get a good goalie. But, you know, it's kind of like if you are in a position where your goalie is getting so many shots on him, I think that's a bad situation. Yeah. It's it's because it, I've watched so much soccer over the years. It's like if you're if you are just letting him get by you that much, it's just something that that you need to work on that and stopping him more than uh, giving the goalie credit. You'll give the goalie credit, but the defense needs to uh, keep up the pace. Yeah, the thing is like the the fact that it was close in the beginning of the game, and I think we we you saw like the Kings had a little bit of a hangover, and but the, in the third period, it really showed like like everybody thought going into the series. I mean, I remember hearing one analyst quoted as saying that the Rangers are going to play the series of their lives and not get embarrassed by the Kings. And the Western Conference is that much better than the East. And I mean, you you hear those things in, in other sports too. We're going to talk about that a little bit later at the NBA. But I mean, you, you hear those things and you expect the Kings to come out and, and dominate the Rangers. And the first couple periods. They, they kind of played with a little bit of a hangover, and in the third period, they really showed that dominance that everybody expected out of them, getting 20 shots on goal. If, if Ludquist doesn't get those saves, then I don't even think it's a close game. So it makes me wonder, Josh, I mean, is the first two periods of this game or the third period more of an indication of what we can expect to see in this series? I honestly think the third period, just because um, if you watch the third period of that game, that, that third period was a freaking dogfight. I mean... The first two periods, I mean, every there's there's going to be a stretch like that for every, and, and for the, I think there'll be another stretch like that in, in this series, and just we're going to come come down, come down to. I know what you meant by some people, some of the analysts are talking about, you know, a potential sweep. I didn't go that far, mm-hmm. but I think it's just going to be more. How does really? What my big question now is how do the Rangers um, respond to this? Because I mean, it was really you you can you can just tell that as, 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 once that overtime goal went through, they just they were deflated. Mm-hmm. I think they understood the opportunity they let slip away from them because, I mean, I, I, what more can you ask from, from Henrik Lundqvist? I mean, yeah. you know, 40 saves on 43 shots is just incredible. And the fact that he he took uh, – he got 20 shots against him in the third period and did not give up a goal is, yeah. is just – I mean, the, the, we, we talked about it in the past about how a, a well-playing goalie can really be an advantage in the series, but – how far can you know? He he can't do much better than that. Ninety three percent. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you just you either have to stiffen up the defense, or you got to put some you got to put the puck in the net. Which I mean, from the you know from the fifteen minute mark in the first period through the rest of the game, the Rangers weren't able to do. Yeah, and he really made a legitimate case that Lundqvist outplayed Jonathan Quick in this game. Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it'd be, it'd be kind of just nit, nitpicking, but I mean, because ne- neither neither goalie played bad. But I mean, just watching him, he was there was he was doing he was making some saves that I've never seen made in my life. Yeah. Yeah, me either. In the three weeks I've been watching hockey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, All right. Well, just just watch the Mighty Ducks trilogy. You'll be good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Love twist heroics aside, uh, what we can definitely agree that the the series is a lot more interesting than maybe some of us thought it was going to be getting into it. Um, I'm personally even a little surprised that we're, we're talking about the Kings being in the series. I thought the Blackhawks being so dominant in game sevens would be, would be here. They're not. Uh, so we have, we have Kings and Rangers and it's, it's looking to be a much better series than people gave it credit for. Uh, Randy, give me your game two pick. Who do you, who do you see winning, winning tomorrow night in La, in Los Angeles? I, I see the Kings winning it. I still see the Kings winning this in six. Uh, and in fact, the way the Kings have been playing, if they won it in five, it wouldn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josh, give me your give me your prediction for game two. Like I, as a whole, I do think that um, that the Kings do win it in six games, but I think the Rangers even it up at one at one one. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that's good. That's, I also had the Rangers winning uh, game two. I, I think that the fact that they were able to keep it so close in game one, one bounce here or there, I don't think it's too outlandish to think that the Rangers could steal a game two. I now I expect Los Angeles to come back into New York's ice and take one themselves. But I, I do see the series going six games. I do see the Rangers winning game two. Uh Drew, do you have a series and game two prediction? Yes, yes. I uh I, I think the Rangers will win game two, you know, just because it's kind of like that mentality is like I I doubt they're gonna be so deflated to the point they know what the situation they're in. They knew they were this close to winning game one. They know they can win game two if they need to. But I mean I, I was on I was going with Kings in seven. I honestly believe this is gonna be a tough series to win. Mm-hmm. And I think it could go either way. And just like it showed in game one, you know, it could go either way really quickly. I, I think that there's a Maybe there's a huge talent disparity between the West and the East, but I don't know if there's like a that massive of a disparity between New York and Los Angeles. I think the Rangers are a lot better than people give them credit for. Um, we're going to move on some NFL talk. Uh, yesterday, 
Colin Kaepernick, the 49ers quarterback, was entering the last year of his deal this year. He was going to be making under a million dollars this year. He signed a, a six-year contract extension for $61 million in guaranteed money. That's the highest number of guaranteed money any player in NFL history has ever gotten. The contract can reach up to $126 million with incentives. He signed a 12-year, a $12 million signing bonus, which is kind of pedestrian for a contract of this size, but he signed a smaller signing bonus over the course of five years so that the 49ers had a little more flexibility in re-signing some of their other players like Vernon Davis. Um, the details of that contract can be found on NinersNation.com. There's a lot of like uh, – there's a lot of details there that are really confusing. Uh, there's like a lot of technicalities and stuff that the 49ers put into it to protect themselves in case he doesn't play well. But to, if he if he earns the money, he'll get the money kind of thing. I do know his cap number for the first year of the extension is $17 million, so they are still going to be handicapped a little bit with what they can do with their salary cap. Uh, Josh, do you think Colin Kaepernick is worth top five quarterback money? The way I look at it is the way I look at it with a lot of these other quarterback extensions the last few years, you know, Matt Ryan, Joe Flacco, Tony Romo, et cetera. It might sound ridiculous, you know, just the, the, the pure number for what Colin Kaepernick has or hasn't done on the field. But just thinking about it like this, if he hits the open market, what would a team like Jacksonville or Cleveland have thrown at him? Oh, yeah. As, as the way I look at it, just with just in general, like I'm not necessarily the biggest Colin Kaepernick fan in the world for well-known reasons. Um, I – He's – if you have a top – I mean, he it, it's not far-fetched to think he's, what, a top 12 quarterback? No, not at all. No, no in, in there somewhere. Um, and if you have one of those guys, you pay them – you pay them to make sure they don't hit the open market now. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I mean, for all the nitpicking that I've seen on Twitter and Facebook over the last couple of years about it, the only – the biggest question I have about it now is – I wonder how this is going to – how this will affect some of the other quarterbacks that are going to be up for extension in the next few years. Yeah, a couple of those guys are uh, Cam Newton, who is in the same draft class as Kaepernick, uh, Russell Wilson, Robert Griffin, Andrew Luck. I've heard some people say that Andrew Luck could be looking at maybe $25 million a year. Yeah, I've heard I've absurd. heard that. Absurd. Yeah. But, I mean, you – the thing is, to be successful in the NFL, you need a good quarterback. Teams like Minnesota and Cleveland and Oakland and Jacksonville have struggled for over a decade because they don't have that quarterback. You, it's the most important position in sports. If you find one, you have to pay him. That's the problem with being good is you have to pay your quarterback, and you, have, you will lose some of these good players in the process. Yeah. And that's the problem in the salary cap era with keeping a really good team together is you have to pay certain skill position players. You can't keep everyone. Uh -huh. So I, I think the 49ers have a small window now to win a championship with the yeah. team they still have. If they won the Super Bowl this year, I mean, they'd be fine. And I, and I do think they have a really good chance of doing that, yeah. by the way, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I, the important thing to note here is the, the Niners wanted him. The deal got done in one day of negotiations. Harbaugh publicly campaigned for him to get the deal done. Uh, they, they needed to get their guy. They have a new stadium they're, they're going to be playing in this year. They needed to sign their face of the franchise. Uh, the, the, the important thing also is, like, maybe his numbers weren't that great last year. you got to remember – Crabtree was injured all year. They have C.B. Johnson now to help out with Anquan Bolden, Vernon Davis. So Brandon they've got him Boyd. some. They've got him some weapons. Yeah, uh, they've had a lot of success though with with Kaepernick at quarterback yeah. since in the two and a half years he's been there. To the Super Bowl, they've been to two NFC title games. So Randy, why are why are people looking at Kaepernick's numbers and not his success in like leading the team to these big games in the playoffs? Well, I think. For a quarterback of his caliber, you have to overpay because if you're if you're not going to overpay, somebody else will. Uh, it, you, we talk about it all the time, just like you said, you have to win in this. You have to win in this league with a quarterback, and uh, I think I think his. I think with him, I think you see a lot of uh, a lot of people looking at some of the the negative plays. Uh, I know there was some disappointment with him in the NFC Championship, but he went up against such a good defense. I, I think his signing kind of enhances the importance in the salary cap era of not overpaying for role players because you're you're going to have to you're going to have to pay those stars, you know, the the eye-popping figures in order to keep them. Just like you said with the Colts, they'll have to do the same thing with uh with Andrew Luck once his once his contract comes up. So I mean, I I look at it and, you know, I I think the best thing the the thing if I were a Niners fan to look at it is Colin Kaepernick is betting on himself. Uh like you said, the uh the signing bonus is fairly pedestrian. Uh, but he's betting on, okay, if I do what I think I can do, I'm going to be one of the highest paid players in the league. Uh, so, I mean, it, if, if I were a Niners fan, I'd feel really confident about that. This is not a guy that's looking for his big signing bonus and then can sit back and, and j just be just be decent. 
he's betting on himself being great. And if he is great, then pay the man. Yeah, he's got to play for the money. This isn't a situation like Albert Hainsworth where once he got paid, he got to sit back and chill. <laughs> you know, Kaepernick, Kaepernick got paid, but he, he's getting paid with the caveat he has to still play well. And I think that's good. And I like that he's such a team guy that he was willing to get his contract done to where they could keep other guys, helping out his tight end and Vernon Davis to get that extension. Yeah. I, I really, I really, I'm a big fan of Kaepernick. He, I, he's cocky on the field, but he's, he's, a, he's a good guy. You hear the but, stories all the time. But playing, but playing devil's advocate with that, or let's say he does live up for that contract and then three years he's like well where's the rest well, then he'll start it'll be like that old philadelphia eagle strategy where they where they sign guys to, to team-friendly contracts at the time and in three years they're, they're holding out wanting more money i'm just playing devil's advocate here uh, i mean it's 61 million dollars i don't i don't think he's yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure you're gonna pull a charles freewell saying he can't <laughs> feed his family with that right <laughs> <laughs> Drew, what, okay, so something $61 million of it is guaranteed no matter what. That's still a lot of money. What, what do you think, Drew, of the – how much is this going to handicap the 49ers cap situation of being able to re-sign some of their other guys or being able to bring in some other players to the team? Do, do you think that the ends justify the means in paying Kaepernick maybe losing some other players? Yeah, it's always like that. You know, whenever you sign a star player, you're going to lose a lot of other positions in the process. But – I, right now, the 49ers team, as uh, Chester, you mentioned, I think they could go out this year and win a Super Bowl. So right now, they're fine. It's just down the line. They're going to have issues re-signing those players. And, it, and when, that, when that happens, you just got to replace them with people you find in the draft, you know, or just trade for people who you think you could do, be good along the line. When it comes to Kaepernick's uh, contract, you know, you guys mentioned, it's the risk and reward. You know, if he works hard, he's going to get the money. But he's still very young. And I think when it comes to like, like his plan, I think uh, some of you guys mentioned that he's very young still. He's going to make the mistakes that young quarterbacks will make in the league. Russell Wilson made mistakes, and you know he, he he's lucky he went on. He's on a team that's won a Super Bowl. I, I don't think if Russell Wilson was on another team, he'd be having as much success. And I think Colin Kaepernick is in the same boat. You know, he's been on the 49ers team that's been vouching for a Super Bowl since he's been there. But hey, you know, I, I like the kid. Uh, my stepdad makes fun of him because he has all his tattoos, makes him look like a gangster. But you know, that's that's just a lifestyle type of thing. It's not that it, to me, it's fine. I, I hope he, I hope he could play through this contract, and I, and it w- I think it will. I think they'll be able to still reach down like Vernon Davis and some of their defensive players, but it's just going to be like those those role players that they uh, that help the team. But, you know, they could go elsewhere and get more money. I think that that's where they're going to have the most issue with. Those people that you don't really pay attention to, but they help out the team in many ways. Well, yeah. another thing that's good that we didn't mention is the uh, 49ers are, are very good at the draft game. Um, these Those small, low players they're going to lose, they'll be able to replace. They they had the highest rated grade on their draft this year from NFL.com. Uh, well, what's be, that mean? Up. No, I know, I know. I'm just saying they they typically draft really well. They they are their roster is filled with Pro Bowlers but, for a reason. But, but but again, just something else you can think about too. That was the same. That was the same thing that they were, that, that a lot of people were saying about the Patriots when Tom Brady got his first big money contract, and they haven't and they haven't won a title since. So it well. Well, then, no, the thing about Tom Brady is at least, you know what, we mentioned how Colin Kaepernick, you know, it's, his contract is set up so they'll be able to re-sign people. You know, Tom Brady is one of those guys now that he's, like, taking pay cuts from his his contract so the Patriots are able to sign people. He's and, making $60 million in guaranteed money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but, but, yeah, but just generally speaking, once um, you're kind of handicapped a little bit, this could go to go, go towards any of the teams with a young quarterback, you know, Carolina, Seattle, whatever. Once your quarterback is eating up a tenth of your salary cap, it really hinders how, you know, how many of these quote-unquote role players you can sign and how many of – especially with a team like San Francisco. But you can't really – I'd say more Seattle than San Francisco because cause over the last couple of years, there aren't too many Jim Harbaugh guy, draft picks that have actually played outside of, outside of all of them Smith. Um, it's more it's more from some of the other teams like Seattle and you know New, and Indianapolis and stuff. Once your quarterback's making that much money, and a lot of those other role players are going to be coming up on their sec- second contracts, is where you're going to have to be making a lot of your a lot of really tough decisions, I'd imagine. Yeah, and, and Seattle already lost a couple of guys in their Super Bowl roster when they had to resign uh, Richard Sherman and uh, Thomas safety. Yeah, Thomas. Earl Thomas. Yeah. So I mean, I, I you can't imagine what's going to happen when they have to resign Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's a, it's really hard to parody in the NFL. I, I don't, I don't see the Seahawks winning again for a long time. But the uh, the 49ers, they have this little window. Uh, 
they, they want to get there. They're doing everything they can to get there. They couldn't risk Kaepernick becoming a free agent next year. Exactly. They had to re-sign him. They did it in a way that mm-hmm. if he doesn't play up to par, they're not committed to all that money. And if he does, he deserves it, and it's fine. Yeah. So and- I'm completely behind the decision to pay him. I think that it's good that he took a lower signing bonus so they could re-sign other players. Mm-hmm. And Relatively I, speaking, I guess. Yeah. For, they'll, <laughs> they'll sign the important ones. So. Yeah, like I'd imagine Vernon Davis will get extended, Michael Crabtree, Joe Staley, guys like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Offensive players. Right. <laughs> People yeah, on well, this side of the ball. Yeah, right. And I also think that if you look at a lot of the uh, this uh, this extension and then some of the other ones, um, I'd imagine that it's going to be – I think a lot of teams are looking at what, what happened with Baltimore and Joe Flacco as like a cautionary tale now. Mm-hmm. Did, did, would, um, did, you know, did San Francisco really want to go into the final year of Colin Kaepernick's contract with that – with the, with um, potential Joe Flacco situation happening. I think that's kind of scared a lot of, a lot of teams off of, um, um, away from, you know, letting players play out the final year, especially quarterbacks play out the final year of a contract. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we've, we've spun our wheels a lot on the uh, Kaepernick situation. For the most part, we agree. Four and is the right thing. They had to pay their guy. It's not a necessarily a matter of, is he a $61 million player right now? It's a matter of quarterbacks are a rare breed and you have to pay them to keep them. And, 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 and I mean, like, like Drew had a good point, too. He's, he's been a starter for two and a half seasons now. He's going into his, like, third season, his third full season as a starting quarterback. He's already been to two NFC Championship <laughs> games and a Super Bowl. Um, so, I mean, I think the, if, you, I think if, the, you're gonna, if you're going to pay anyone, you're going to pay Colin yeah. Kaepernick. I'm sorry. I just think the, the most polarizing part of him is similar to what I say about Cam Newton as well. When they look great, they look unstoppable. But when they look bad, they look just they yeah. look like Blank Gabbard. That's the big thing. But also, it's, and also, this contract is largely projecting because I mean, it, it, it's a, it wouldn't be an outrageous statement to say in five years Andrew Luck might not, not Andrew Luck, but Colin Kaepernick might not be the best quarterback in the league in five years. You never know. Mm-hmm. And that's not a ridiculous statement to make. Exactly. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on to some sad news. We would be ill mentioned if we didn't bring this up. Uh, Don Zimmer, a legend in the baseball world, passed away yesterday at 83 years old. Spent 66 of his 83 years on this planet. In Major League Baseball, Minor League Baseball, uh, very loved guy, very well respected guy. So a little hit background history on him: He played six seasons in the minor leagues, was hit in the temple by a pitch in '53, and nearly died. Had to have holes drilled in his head to relieve the swelling. Couldn't walk or talk. Lost 50 pounds and was told he would never play baseball again. He went on to play 12 years in the major leagues with the Dodgers, Cubs, Mets, Reds, Senators, and Flyers. He played two world. He played in two World Series with the Dodgers in '55 and '59 and made the NL All Star team in '61. He was the manager or the third base coach in the 1975 World Series for the Red Sox. He's famously known for yelling "Go." No, 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 at base runner Denny Doyle, which was mistakenly heard as go, 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 and he was thrown out of the plate. The Sox went on to lose the series. He was a Sox manager for three seasons afterward. He would go on to coach or manage with the Rangers, Yankees, Giants, Cubs, Rockies, and Rays. He retired a six-time World Series champion, twice as a player, four times as a coach manager, and won the NL Manager of the Year Award in 89 with the Cubs. So thoughts and prayers to his family and everyone who loved or respected or crossed Don Zimmer's path at some point in Major League Baseball. Uh, I know you guys have some thoughts on this. Randy, we'll start with you. Uh, I personally have never met the man, but whenever whenever you speak or hear hear someone speak about people that were around him, uh, they 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 were changed. They were they were different people for having met him. I there was a beautiful uh, sort of eulogy from uh, Vince Scully last night during the Dodgers game, uh, remembering uh, remembering Don Zimmer. And he's just a guy. He's just one of those guys that when you think of think of those baseball lifers, he's just one of those people. The guy was just a legend. Mm-hmm. Josh, do you have anything to add? And no, I mean, yeah, just like you know, like from what I mean, obviously I've never met the man, but from what I and I don't know if you guys ever, I don't know if you guys saw, but I know it was, it was on Baseball Tonight last night. They um they showed Joe Madden in his press conference talking about, him, and he looked, and he's one of the people that a lot of baseball people said is, was was one of the closest to him, and um. He kind of was just telling stories about when you know the team wasn't playing well. He would kind of just hey, he'd have him come talk to the team. He have give a lot of advice, great stories, and he he looked on the verge of tears a few times. And I mean, just from everything I've heard over the last few years about him, he's one of those people that will be sorely missed, not only in the sports world but just on the planet as a whole. Mm-hmm. Drew, 
I, I didn't know. I don't didn't recall Don Zimmer's name until you mentioned that uh, he was the one that uh, got hit in the temple with the baseball. And as soon as you mentioned that, that's when I remembered a lot of him. And to me, he's kind of like that true underdog story. Like you mentioned, uh, they said he couldn't wouldn't be able to play baseball again, and then he came back and did play baseball. Mm-hmm. So that alone, he's he's a good role model, a good a good man to look up to. And from that respect, um, I, I do feel bad for the family, his family. I do my thoughts and prayers go out to him. And I really hope, uh, I, yeah, that's about it. All right. Well, like we always said, baseball lost a, a great person and they, and they lost a legend in the sport and, uh, and he'll be missed. Uh, we're going to move on to some NBA talks and before NBA portion of the show, before we get into the finals, which I'm sure everybody is excited about, we're going to, we're going to talk about, you know, the elephant in the room, the, the player everybody wants to talk about, the player everybody wants on their team. Lance Stevenson? Yeah, Lance Stevenson. No, we're talking about, <laughs> Kev, we're talking about Kevin Love. Uh, he, you know, there's been rumors surrounding Love since he said that he would opt out of his deal with the Timberwolves after next season, that he wants to play for a winner. The Timberwolves have the longest drought of any NBA team of making the playoffs, standing at 10 years now. Love has been there for all of his seasons in the league. He does not want to play for Minnesota anymore. He does not see a bright future with that team. Uh, earlier today, Flip Saunders announced he would step down and coach the team. Love said, and he's been quoted as, that that changes nothing. His plan is still to leave Minnesota. I don't blame him. It's not like Flip Saunders is a, woo, exciting hire. So, um, and it's freaking Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame him. It's it's a football town, and the football team there sucks too. So let's be real. Um, the Right now, there are three teams uh, that everybody's been linking him to. The front runners are actually the Sacramento Kings. Uh, they're willing to trade anyone but DeMarcus Cousins, and they don't need a promise to level sign an extension. They will take the risk that he would get a one-year flyer and leave. The reason for that is Love wants to play in California. He's from there. He played at UCLA. The Lakers are a mess. They don't have enough to offer the Timberwolves anyway. The Clippers are set with Blake Griffin. The Warriors refuse to give up Klay Thompson. So the Kings are saying – we know we're not an appealing enough location to bring in a big-name free agent, but we can try to trade for one and convince him to stay. And they think that the fact that they're based in California and the other op- options are less appealing right now, that they have a chance to convince Love to stay. They want to pair him with DeMarcus Cousins, so they're willing to trade anyone on their roster but Cousins. Right now, the rumored trade would involve the number eight pick in this year's draft, as well as Ben McLemore, who was the seventh pick in last year's draft. And they could also recruit other teams to get involved if the Wolves want draft choices. They have Jason Thompson, Travis Outlaw, Derek Williams, or Jason Terry that they can move to make the salaries work. And the thing is, is the reason that the Timberwolves aren't enamored with, say, what Boston can give them is Boston doesn't have as much as many talented players to throw into a deal. They don't want to give up Rajon Rondo, which is the one player Minnesota wants. They want to pair love with Rondo. Uh, so they don't have a player, really. Sellinger is like the best player they can give up, and, and that's not what Minnesota wants for Kevin Love. The Boston can't put a good enough deal together, even with their draft picks. Um, Chicago made an offer. They didn't release what the details are, but they do have the 16th and 19th picks on the draft this year. Carlos Boozer, who would give them cap relief because he has one year on his deal. Taj Gibson, Jimmy Butler, and the rights to the most talented player in Europe, and Nikola Muratic. I think Chicago would be giving up too much if they have to give up most of that to get love when they could just sign Carmelo Anthony and try to get a championship now. But that's me personally. That doesn't have anything to do with what Chicago wants to do. Um, but right now, Sacramento's the front runner. They're, they're willing to give up a King's ransom to have a chance to convince him to stay. They're pairing him with Rudy Gay and DeMarcus Cousins this year is really appealing. I, I think the Kings can make the playoffs with that group. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what Love wants to do. Uh, have you guys? Well, let's see, Josh. What do you What do you think happens if uh, if Love ends up in Sacramento? If if the trade is number eight pick Macklemore and some other guys to match the salaries, what do you think? Uh, group of Love, Gay, Thomas, and Cousins can do in Sacramento, and do you think he would consider staying with that team? Well, first of all, I'll, 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 I'll start by saying this part of my French, fuck the Sacramento Kings. Right. <laughs> but, um, all, but all jokes aside, I think that if that did happen, I don't know. To be, to be completely honest with you, if you wanted to play, like, I sometimes forget the Kings actually play in California. Ooh. But I just think if you just look at that, 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 team, that, that group, they could at the very least 
be be turned into the new what's well, um the well, uh, Phoenix Suns of the Western Conference. Where I think though I don't know if that that team just would not 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 detriment around the talent that would be on that team is just it would kind of be just the West is so loaded <laughs> more than anything. Yeah. And, and honestly, Kevin Love is one of my favorite players in the league, and not just because he's white. Um, oh, is... <laughs> but but I mean, he's just he's one of the probably one of the more underrated players in the league. And I just think he honestly he deserves to, to play for a winner because I mean, go back to the Kings thing. I mean, a team that doesn't exist has been been the playoffs more more recently than, than, than the Wolves have. Mm-hmm. So I mean, right. I can't really like I can't really I, I couldn't imagine I can't really fault the guy for wanting to you know because I mean in I mean when he was in high school when he was in middle school high school I'm sure he won championships out of the ass when he was when he went when he was at, when he went to UCLA they went to the went to a Final Four then he went to Minnesota and well yeah, the winning stopped yeah now if you're if you're Kevin Love and you're trying to get to a better in a situation where you can win why, why the fuck are you gonna stay with the Kings it doesn't matter if they're in California. You can just in the in the off season you can sign with the storied Los Angeles Lakers. Fuck the Kings. Well, I don't yeah. understand why they make this move. Like Macklemore will probably be a good player for them, and the eighth pick in, in a really deep draft. This is the thing. This is why the, the Timberwolves have to trade Kevin Love now. This is the deepest draft since 2003, since the draft LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh were in. You you have to. You have, if you're going to pull the trigger, you know Love is leaving anyway. A top 10 pick in this draft is more valuable than almost any player you can get reasonably for Kevin Love in a trade. So they, they make this trade before the draft. I almost guarantee it. Sacramento giving up a, a talented player, a top 10 pick from last year, and a top 10 pick in this draft to get Kevin Love for a year because he is going to bolt Sacramento. I don't see why they do that. I don't see why the Kings do that, which is why I still think Chicago is going to trade for him, and which bugs me because I don't want Chicago to trade for Kevin Love. I want, I would, I want them to not think about the future and, and try to win a championship while that window is still there. I mean, Noah was third in MVP voting this year, for God's sakes. Joakim Noah, Derek Rose, and Carmelo Anthony, that is a, a, enough with the core team they already have. You're basically adding Carmelo Anthony to the Bulls. You're taking Boozer's minutes away, you're giving them to Taj Gibson, and you're inserting Carmelo Anthony into the lineup. And for the people, this is, this is slightly off topic, for the people that want to get on Carmelo's case for the Knicks and say that he didn't do anything in New York, it is a team game. LeBron James did not win on his own. You add a scorer like Carmelo Anthony, arguably a top, five, a top three scorer in the league, and you put him on a team like Chicago, and they compete. And that's why I don't think it makes sense for Chicago either. Honestly, I'm not sure Love is going to get traded. If he doesn't get traded before the draft, they might just let him walk for free. And, and, that, mm. and, I, and I also think the Kings making that trade, giving up all those assets, having him walk anyway is just as bad as the Timberwolves letting him walk for free. Uh, Drew, you clearly have some thoughts. You're probably just going to rag on the Bulls and not say anything about no. Kevin Love, but go on. No, no, no. <laughs> if he won't, no, if he I, won't gonna, I will. No, no I was only going to mention one thing. I don't I don't think the issue would be me- mellow if he went to the Bulls. I think the issue with that is just Derrick Rose needs to re- get just get back to being Derrick Rose. I don't know if they'd be able to win a championship next year even if they got mellow. It's just that they need Derrick Rose to get back, and I don't know if we're ever going to see the Derrick Rose pre-injury. I think that's going to be an experiment next year. But when it comes to the Kevin Love situation, you mentioned Sacramento. That that intrigues me because uh, Kevin Love, DeMarcus Cousins, front court, and Rudy Gay, technically, that front court, it sounds good, even though Rudy Gay might be one of the most overrated players in the history of the NBA. I hate Rudy Gay with a passion. <laughs> I yeah. He's I, the most ISO ball player in the world. Yes. Like, well, no, absolutely. There's, there's people who defend him despite the fact he shoots like 41 percent as a small forward, and it just and he gets like this. I think he has like a 17 million dollar contract, and I'm like, why? Just why? He's a good player, but God, he he just needs a point guard that, or something. He doesn't need the ball, but that that front court to me it sounds appealing, but I don't it wouldn't I don't think it would mesh well. It just it just seems too weird. You mentioned the Celtics. Um, I don't know where who who they could trade with. You mentioned the Bulls. That sounds interesting. Um, Cleveland flew through. Uh, I think I believe they threw out a possibility of trading the the first pick in the draft, didn't they? That's also idiotic as hell. Yeah. That, that hinges on the fact that they think that Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love can lure LeBron James back to Cleveland. That's a pipe dream. 
that or that or they believe that Kyrie Irving and Ky- Kevin Love could be a good duo, which I do believe so. I think Kyrie Irving's issue is that he doesn't have another star with him right now, and I'm afraid. And if they don't, and I think if Cleveland doesn't do anything to get a star this year, I think Kyrie's going to be bolting out of there. There's no reason for Kyrie to stay. It's obvious he needs a better player with him if he wants to succeed in the NBA. Do you think trading the number one pick and the most hyped draft since 2000? Except here's the thing. For any people, player. Is oh, my perfect. God. Okay. Oh, hold, hold on. Hold on. First off, there's people who are sitting on this draft for being not as good as previously previously expected. Andrew Wiggins didn't look good this year. Javari Parker didn't show up in the in the tournament. Joe Embiid has uh, back issues that, you know, he has good potential. Back. But he could, he could be the next Greg Oden. Back issues are a big deal. You know, look at – Larry Bird, he had back issues. He had to retire early. Who knows what he could have done if he didn't have those issues. I'm just saying, uh, this could be a great draft. This could be a bust of a draft, and that could be it could be the 2013 draft. Okay, and when it came, comes to trading Ben McLemore and the eighth pick, I say go for it. The reason why I say that is that Ben McLemore, he's not going to be good. He's not that good of a player anyways. It's almost The only good player I could see being coming out of this uh, of the 2013 draft is uh, Gorgie Dean, or however the hell you say his name, who from uh, Minnesota, who who rides Pine there, but he was averaging like 15 points, 13 rebounds when Pekovic got injured late in the season. I think they need to worry about trading Pekovic and Kevin Love, or do something with that. I think that's their issue right now because Dang looks fantastic. I think he could be more help to his team than those two can. All right, before I move on to Randy, I'm going to say something that's going to make Drew mad and probably everybody else listening. De- Rudy Gay, with his player option, makes $19 million this 19 year for the million. Kings. That is $1 million less dollars than LeBron James makes for the Miami Heat. Randy, <laughs> we're going to go to you. Uh, what, do you what do you think about uh, Kevin Love to Sacramento or any of those other places? I, I don't quite understand from the Sacramento standpoint. I, I'm actually okay with Ben McLemore. I think with he and – he and uh, Isaiah Thomas and DeMarcus Cousins, I think they have a good young core they're building with that team. Uh, so I don't really see why blowing it up for a one-year rental would do much because I don't think you have enough in the long term. Kevin Love has not – I mean, the, uh, he has not officially said, I want to play in California. That's speculation. What he has said is he said, I want to play for a winner. Mm-hmm. So that means he's not going to want to go to Boston because it doesn't matter what Boston gives them. If you add Kevin Love to the Celtics right now – they're a better team. They're probably a playoff team, but they're not a winner. They're, they wouldn't get past uh, Miami, Indy, uh, Chicago. I see him. I see him going to a lower tier playoff team that already. I don't see him going to one of these teams that missed the playoffs last year. I will. I will say this about this year's draft. There is no sure thing in this draft. Even though the draft is so deep, for most teams, you only get one pick. So that one pick, you whoever it is you pick up, if it doesn't work out for you, it doesn't matter who else is in that draft. You've blown your chance at it. So I I look at it to where if you can always take a known commodity player to trade for a draft pick, if that known commodity is something that you need for your team, I think you you make the deal. But in the case of Sacramento, I don't really see that. I think the big winner in all this is actually the Timberwolves because you you're seeing multiple offers. You're it, it shows the interest. It's just going to be who wants him the most and who's willing to give up the most. So if, if you're the Timberwolves, I think you try to hold out as long as possible just to get, get the best offer. Turn them against each other, right? Make a, Turn up the heat a little bit. Make the offers get bigger and bigger. The, the thing is, if, if they wait to next year, then they know that the teams that want them can just get them in free agency. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah it has to be this year. I, I think that the hottest time to do it is before the draft, but I think you just wait till the night of the draft. Well, and, then, yeah. and then you really just you milk it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if we're going to be sitting around one morning on ESPN and just get, getting up with our coffee and seeing Kevin Love has been traded to the Phoenix Suns for three of their five million first round picks or whatever. But people actually, people still watch ESPN? Yeah, man. <laughs> no, they don't. They listen to Sports Talk Weekly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move into some NBA Finals talk because I'm tired of hearing about Kevin Love on ESPN and my own show. Uh, we have. At 9 o'clock tonight, the Spurs and Heat will play game one of their rematch from last year's finals. Uh, the Vegas line has the Spurs winning in seven. Uh, we'll go ahead and look, look at some serious predictions out of the way before we talk about the actual games. Josh, give me a prediction on the NBA finals and, and, and number of games, winner and number of games. Heat and four. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just I, sit I, on, old man. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think the Heat do win, but I think they win in six games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drew? Spurs in five. You're 
crazy. Um, I'm not crazy. Randy? Spurs and six. Spurs and six. I have Heat and six as well. I'm with Josh. Uh, well, okay. Well, we're going to – we'll go ahead and get into some of that. First of all, the uh, finals format this year is different than past years. Instead of the 2-3-2 two, two format where it's two games in San Antonio, three in Miami, two in San Antonio, it's the 2-2-1-1-1 two, two, one, one, one format that you play throughout the rest of the playoffs. So the first two games will be in San Antonio. The next two in Miami, game five in San Antonio, game six in Miami, and then game seven back in San Antonio, which I think actually gives an edge to Miami because if tip, typically these teams are so close in, in talent that I, I think it's not unreasonable for Miami to steal one of the first two games in San Antonio and then probably game two. And then you have them when if they win their home games, they, they just have to. They they take a or or they split their they split their home games. If they steal a game five, game six is in their place. The Spurs are facing elimination on the road at that point. I think the two three two format was better for the NBA finals, but that's neither here nor there. I do think the two two one 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 advantage gives it to a slight advantage to Miami. I, I actually have Spurs winning game one, Heat winning games two and three, Spurs taking game four, and then it going two two back to San Antonio. The Heat steal that game, and then game six is in their place. And I think that basketball being a sport where an individual player can dominate the game, LeBron being the best player in the world, a transcending talent, I think that knowing he can clinch it at home and clinch a three-peat, I think that the Heat win game six in Miami. But uh, I do have the Spurs winning game one, so you know, there's that. Uh, Josh, why don't you talk about the series a little bit for us and uh, your thoughts on why, why you think the Heat will win in six games. And give me the finals MVP. I obviously think it's going to be LeBron, but do you, if maybe you have someone different. Richard Lewis. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but not what I'd like. Just I really can't really add anything. I mean, the way the, this is honestly like I, I'm admittedly not the biggest NBA fan in the world, and I but I have watched quite a bit of the playoffs. It was the only NBA I actually watch anymore. It seems like. Um, but um, like I said, there's really the NBA. Unlike the M- N- NFL, Major League Baseball, there's usually when you have one player that's as good as. LeBron James, Kevin Durant, you know, pick your superstar. You could, they could almost single-handedly carry you to a championship. But that's not to that's not to discount the rest of the Heat, the Heat team. I mean, people people, people t- tend to forget that before before LeBron got there, Dwayne Wade was arguably a top five player. And I just think, and he just he 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 seems to do this every year where he kind of hobbles through the playoffs or through the regular season almost li- almost literally, and then just turns it on in in the um, in the playoffs. And I think really. He he. Um, the two of them together are. I think they're top. T- I think Dwayne Wade and um, <clears throat> LeBron James are probably the best one-two punch in the NBA. And I just don't. I think that uh, that's going to come down to it. And just I think the, the way the format was changing is confusing, as you made it sound. Um, um, I think it honestly helps Miami a little bit more, just because the two th- it was two-three-two before, I believe. Um, yeah. And, no, yeah. Just, and just as a, as as just as a fan, just, it makes it really hard because it really it gives honestly the road team in, in the first um, two games really a, I wouldn't say unfair because I mean you um, but it gives them a little bit of an advantage and um, I think just changing it up kind of helps the format a little bit and just I think honestly this is going to sound kind of cookie cutter but I think that the Spurs might have given everything they had to beat the Thunder. Mm. The the to me the Spurs are a better team than the Heat. But, but LeBron and he have the best player in the world by far. LeBron yeah. is so much better than everyone on San Antonio. The thing that's really clinching it for me for Miami, though, is the fact that Dwayne Wade looks healthy. Like, having a healthy Dwayne Wade with a motivated LeBron James. He said he those last couple of years in Cleveland, he wasn't feeling like the same player. And once he finally got over that hump and won that first championship in Miami, it rejuvenated him. And he's been on a mission since then, winning MVP awards. It took a career season by Durant this year to strip that MVP from LeBron. And also, whoever that one analyst was who didn't vote for LeBron for the All-NBA team, fuck you, you're an idiot. But <laughs> Durant was the only unanimous selection for the All-NBA team this year. Not yeah. not the best player since Michael Jordan, but Kevin Durant. But the fact that the uh, – the fact that we have a, a focused, motivated LeBron James with a chip on his shoulder. This team plays with a chip on the shoulder because they always they're always doubted. A team that is made is going to their fourth straight NBA Finals, which hasn't been done since the Celtics, like way back when in like the fucking sixties or some shit. Some. Yeah. <laughs> fucking sure. You've got the Heat. You've got the, you've got the Heat going to their fourth straight NBA Finals, and they're being talked about like they don't have a chance against like San Antonio. San Antonio is probably a little bit better basketball team overall. They're deeper. They have a better bench. Whatever. But 
the, the heat of the, of this chip on their shoulder, and that matters. That matters when you've got guys like LeBron and Wade. And LeBron's in his prime. Bosh is a great player when he wants to be. Wade's not in his prime, but he's playing healthy, and, that, and that's a big deal. And the Heat's bench is underrated, too. I, I just think it's a lot closer than people are giving it credit. The, the opening line when the finals and Stanley Cup were announced were the same. People said the Heat had just as much of a chance of beating the Spurs as the Rangers did of beating the Kings. Like, are you kidding me? That's so different. Like, I don't, I do not understand why it's so, so obvious to people that the, the Spurs are supposedly a better team. And I'm going to ask the two people who picked the Spurs. I'm going to start with Drew so we can get his nonsense out of the way, and then we can move on to the logic of Randy. So, Drew, go ahead and get your crazy roll going. Um. Okay. Well, first off, the Spurs are a better team. Uh. Second off. Uh, you, you remember late in the season when the Pacers and the Heat had a lot of issues, it looked like? I believe the Heat, the, the issue with the Heat is they went through such an easy path to the finals, going through the Bobcats, uh, Nets team that I don't even know, uh, a dysfunctional Pacers team that they probably shouldn't have lost two games to. The fact that they lost the second one, uh, they probably should have won on five. I think that speaks volumes. That the they second beat. one was rigged, but go on. The second one was rigged. Dude, who the <laughs> fuck cares? If you say you can't say something is rigged anymore in the NBA because you'll just get a, a bullshit <laughs> argument, so it doesn't matter. The issue I have with is that I don't know if the Heat – I feel like the issues that the Heat had at the end of the season are going to show up. They haven't had the best competition to play against up until now. The Spurs is obviously the best team in the NBA. Uh, you know, I the, you, you, you're talking about people with chips on their shoulders. The Spurs – we're one shot away from winning the NBA Finals in six games, if only for Ray Allen making probably the greatest shot in the NBA history. I'm going to go ahead and say that. That's probably will be the best shot in NBA history unless someone could top that in the NBA Finals. That right there, I swear to God, that is the best shot. Mm-hmm. So, so to me, I, I just feel like the, this, you, the Spurs have the bigger chip, if you ask me. they they got to show that they can beat this young team with the team that they have. You know, it's it's always been that built not bought war. You know the 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 P uh, the built team the Spurs of the bot. I think this will be a good series. But the but the reason I just picked five was I just wanted to be ballsy. I don't think they will it will actually be five. I just wanted to say that if it goes to seven <laughs> games, if it goes to seven games, I would not be surprised. But I just want to be ballsy. You'd be like, yeah, I have so much confidence. You know, I got all that swag. Shut up, Drew. Anyways, so. I don't know. I, Tim Duncan always shows up. I, I feel like uh, Kawhi Leonard is going to really show up. He's my pick for the MVP if the Spurs win the series. Ka- Kawhi Leonard is going to be the MVP of the series as well. I think he's going to show up, play really good defense. And, you know, the, the issue is with the Heat, sometimes the bench shows up. They showed up uh, later on in the Pacers series, what, what I know is. And sometimes they don't show up, show up, which is an issue. Richard Lewis, uh, who barely played at all, showed up in uh, in the Pacers series. And I don't know if he'll show up. Ray Allen has a tendency to show up and not show up. And remember, Dwayne Wade did not have the greatest series last year in the finals. That was a team that was carried by LeBron and Ray Allen, who made the greatest shot in NBA history. So if, at the end of the day, I think – I just think the Spurs are the better team, and I think it's and especially with well, you say the Heat have the better chance with this uh, two one two, uh, the two two one 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 format. I think the Spurs easily have a better chance as well. They could easily win the first two games, lose one in Miami, but then pick up another one, and then it's uh, game five up three one. It's it's it works both ways, and I think home court advantage, especially now. What I always hated about the two three two series. If if you're um if you have the first two games and you lose one of them, you better win one of the next three. Otherwise, you are fucked. As the Heat showed a couple years ago against the OKC, they were able to pull out one and OKC. Then they won the next three at Miami. So, I and you know I think the Heat are a good enough team. I think LeBron's going to stay with the Heat. I don't think he's going to opt out of this contract like everyone thinks he is. I think he's going to stay with the Heat. I think the Heat have a good chance at you know doing good things next year. But just for now, I think I'm very satisfied with uh, Tim Duncan, who's never going to age. He's going to play well. And Ginobili, uh, the biggest flopper in the NBA, he's going to flop a little bit. And Danny Green is going to hit some threes as well. So, yeah, that's my prediction. All right. Randy, translate, please. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> – I'm I'm not far off of his point. I think I think it simply comes down to the Heat have better weapons, but the Spurs have more weapons. And when you talk about last year's series, you talk about Richard Lewis having a big game. Talk about Ray Allen having hitting that big shot. 
those guys are not starters. Those, those are guys coming off the bench. I think it's whoever gets the most production from their role players. When, for the, you know, obviously for the Heat, that's guys like, well, even though his game's falling off a little bit, uh, Shane Battier, but guys like Chris Anderson and uh, Ray Allen and, and those kind of guys, uh, Norris Cole. And then for the Spurs, you have obviously the people like Kawhi Leonard and Tiago Splitter. And who who can get the most production from those players? Because your superstars on your team, uh, you know, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, they're going to get theirs. It's who's going to – what role players are going to step up to win this series? I think the the going back to the traditional format, the 2-2-1-1-1, I think that, that actually is an advantage for the Spurs uh, because I think in the 2-3-2 two, two format, if the, if the Spurs lost one of the first two, they'd be in some serious trouble. Uh, but I think it's I think it's really going to come down to I think Kawhi Leonard is going to be a, a difference maker. Uh, Finals MVP candidate probably not, but he's going to make a he's going to have a big impact on this series. He's a young player. I think he got a lot of good playoff experience uh, last year, and I look forward to seeing what he can do not only on the offensive end but as a defender as well. Okay, uh, who who would be your Finals MVP if you had to guess of the series? It's it, it's really hard to tell because with the Spurs that that's that's the inherent nature of the Spurs is someone different can kill you every night. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be hard to say. Obviously, you could say one of the obviouses would be either Parker or Duncan. Um, like I said, it, it may be a guy like Kawhi Leonard if he if he's able to make to be impactful in multiple games. But I mean that's the beauty of the the team ball the built not bought philosophy that the Spurs have. The, the Spurs really can go nine or ten deep. And I just don't see that from the Heat as much. Yes, Ray Allen has given you production. Richard Lewis, I mean, everybody goes back to the Indiana series where he hit six of nine threes. In the previous games before that, he was 0 for 7. So, I mean, let's, let's remember what he's been doing and not just that one game that he had where he was six of nine from three-pointers. Uh, he, he had missed his previous seven. So I, I, do, pick, I do pick the Spurs to win. Uh, that's not as a bitter Pacers fan as someone probably screaming into their headset right now. Uh, but I think the Spurs are a better team. I think even if Indiana would have, uh, if Indiana would have gotten past Miami, the Spurs would have been my pick to, to win there. The Spurs are just a complete team, top to bottom, and uh, I, I think they're the best team in the league. I think it's a consistent team in the league as they've shown throughout the year. All right. One, one more thing we didn't touch on was the Tony Parker situation. Uh, he's going to try to play game one, he, he said, uh, but it's, it's interesting to see how his ankle is going to hold up. During the Thunder series, it was bothering him a lot, and he actually had to pull himself out of the game. So it, it's, a, it's interesting to note Le- LeBron actually was quoted in saying he hopes Parker's 100% healthy because he doesn't want there to be any excuses if Miami beats San Antonio. So that kind of taking a chip at the Spurs, because for some reason, you know, like, like, like I said, everyone counting out the two-time NBA champions, they're like, they're, they're like, like they're massive underdogs. It, it's an interesting series. It seems like everyone you talk to, either it's definitely San Antonio or definitely Miami, and it should be closer than that. I think every game's close. I don't think any of them will be a blowout, and I wouldn't be shocked to see it go seven games. Uh, I'm, San Antonio is a great team. Miami's a great team. It's definitely going to be fun to watch. I wonder if this is the last year for San Antonio. If if, uh, if Duncan and Popovich are going to try again next year, regardless of what happens with this series, that, that'll be an interesting thing to see too. I, I do think it's more likely Duncan retires if they win this year. Yeah, you know I, the the thing with the with the Spurs is they're 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 youngins like Kawhi Leonard. It's going to be interesting to see when uh, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Ginobili they all leave. It's going to be interesting to see what they do with that their young roster, what little that they have. Mm-hmm. But I, I think this will be the last chance they really have with Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and Ginobili, unless they somehow can just never grow up and they just if they just play even less minutes and still produce as well as they do. Because it seems like every year now, Tim Duncan just doesn't even play that much, and he still contributes in the regular season. So it's going to be interesting all the way. It, it, and the, it, the, no one on the Spurs averages more than 30 minutes still, right? Right. And, and the playoffs. So I think that's the most inter- interesting thing about it. In the in the finals, are they going to let Kawhi Leonard, uh, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker run th- run free and play more than 30 minutes? I think that's going to be a, also a big thing if if it happens. Popovich is a master of rotation minutes, like minute management, and he is a master of keeping his rotations together. Like when Parker went out against the Thunder, he brought in Patty Mills back up to start the third quarter because he wanted Patty Mills to come off the bench with the same guys he always comes off with. 
Yeah, good point. Popovich is a brilliant coach, and I've heard my friend who's a huge Homer Lakers fan say he thinks Popovich is a better coach than Phil Jackson. Ooh, so that's, that's quite possible. <laughs> hey, hey li- li- listen, Phil, Phil Jackson has won all of his titles with Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Uh, look, look at how look at how many household names of relatively mediocre players we have from Greg Popovich. Guys who came in without the fanfare. Yeah. I, that that may not be that may not be that far fetched of a statement. Yeah, and just and just the, the, the idea of it just uh, in the abstract, it's not it's not like you're saying Byron Scott's better than Phil Jackson. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's it's feasible. I love that Byron. I I knew the joke was either going to be Byron Scott or Flip Saunders because that's the two oh. NBA coaches we've ragged on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just to be fair though, Popovich has had Tim Duncan, David Robinson. Yeah, you know, those are both Hall of Fame players too. So he's had a couple guys. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Like, having Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, who are both arguably top five players of all time, is almost a detriment to Phil Jackson. One, one more thing I want to cover before we get off the air: the the Heat going into their fourth Finals. A lot of people want to want to compare them to the great teams of the past: the Celtics, the Pistons, the Lakers, the Bulls, the Spurs. Uh, you, you, the great teams, they are able to have consistent success. I don't like to compare generations. One thing those other teams have that Miami hasn't gotten to do, which is a little unfair, is the, those teams all got to play against each other, other teams that were also to, able to repeat in championships. So the Heat not having that test really – and that's why I think this series of the Spurs is a big deal because the Spurs are one of those kinds of franchises. If Miami beats them back to back years, it legitimizes their three peat a little more. So that's why I think it's a big series to them. Um, you're, hmm? Yeah, you're absolutely right with that because I mean, you stop and think about it. Uh, right now, LeBron James is two of four in the NBA Finals. Uh, one, uh, two and two and three for the Heat and zero for one in Cleveland. So I think you look at it, okay, if they win this series, like you said, it legitimized them. They, they've beaten this Western rival now two years in a row. If they lose, now that that franchise, that this group with the big three, is now only two of four in the NBA Finals, which, I mean, you look at, when, which is still great, you still get two times, but when you look comparatively to those Celtics teams and to those Bulls teams, those you know the, when, when those teams went to the Finals, they won when they were there. Mm-hmm. The, the people will already put the Spurs in those conversations, so it's not as important to them as it is to a team like Miami, a team like Miami trying to legitimize itself as a dynasty needs to win this series, I think, a little more than San Antonio does. Uh, I, I don't think anyone's going to look down on any of the players from the Spurs if they don't win this championship. It'll be amazing that they were able to get there again, but if LeBron James doesn't win this championship... He's going to get a lot of shit. How much shit does he get oh, when dude. the finals are over? I don't know. It's going to be – you've got to compare it to the first, uh, the, his first heat run where he didn't win the championship. Do you think he's going to get more shit than he did with that one? But the thing is, the thing is he's, not, he's not doing the whole uh, not one, not two, not three thing. He's like one of the more respectable uh, – he's one of the most respectable men in the NBA. So it's going to be yeah. different. He's not going to get as much heat from like analysts. He's just going to get like the anti-LeBron. The but also, and yeah. also, but people forget with that not one, not two. That, that was at a fan rally, so it wasn't like he was. It, I mean, to be fair, yeah, um, he wasn't bragging. He was trying to hype up the fans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The new thing. But but it was a fan rally that was nationally televised yeah. and was choreographed. I mean, they they came up out of a stage with fog machines. I mean, let's. It was let's, a little let's, ridiculous. Let's be wow. real here. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I thought I thought the Undertaker was going to come out. Come out <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I one, one more one more thing to, to note about the the LeBron getting a lot of crap if they don't win thing. Um, I was too young to remember this, but my, my dad told me when the Bulls kept losing to the Pistons yeah. that Michael Jordan was getting all that shit. Uh, you're not as great as people as you as people make yeah. you out to be, kind of thing. Like yeah. people had that same general opinion yeah. about who ended up becoming the greatest player of all time. So that that is food for thought. Another thing is I really think LeBron needs. To win these championships, to be in that class, he wants to be compared to Michael. He, he yeah. does want to be in that conversation. He wore yeah. the number yeah, three matter- for a reason. He and then the number six, six championships. Like LeBron, LeBron does. He want to be considered in that conversation. And getting a getting a three peat is a big deal. I mean, Jordan had two of them, so LeBron wants to be in that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, and, we're gonna and, and number and number six. That's Doctor J. Yeah. Doctor J. <laughs> 
All right, we're going to get them plugs out of the way. Uh, Josh, go ahead and give me yours. Yeah, my Twitter at Gomez underscore time seven six. There's my fantasy football blog, fantasyfbcorner.wordpress.com. I also write for a pro wrestling blog that's wrestlecrew.wordpress.com. Wait, Randy? Um, follow me on Twitter at rousenhour24. All right, Drew? Uh, if you're interested in TV shows, movies, video games, that kind of stuff, you go to Fanboys Anonymous. I write on there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, just an uh, easy place to, if you are in the geek culture and that kind of stuff. I also am part of wrestling podcasts uh, with the Mega, on Mega Powers Radio. We have uh, the Raw Post Show, which is always on After Raw. And I also uh, lend my voice on Smack Talk, which we usually uh, put on YouTube on Wednesdays or Fridays. So always be on the lookout for that stuff. Wait. All right. You can follow the show on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher Radio. The archive version of this episode will be on all of those avenues. Within 24 hours, you can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Sports Talk Weekly. Follow us on Twitter at Sport Talk Weekly. And you can join our sports discussion page for Bank City Sports Talk. Uh, until then, until next week, you guys, you take care out there in the sports world. 